to sit down. He does this. I sat down. Well, good evening, everybody. Tonight we're going to be in Revelation chapter 10, so let's go ahead and turn there. You got me up here early, so it must mean you think you're going to get out early, but that's not how this works. You give me more time, sometimes I preach longer. Well, tonight I want to give you a message entitled, The God Who Speaks. Uh, we have been with the Apostle John as God has, in a sense, raptured him up to heaven. And he has beheld heavenly glories. He has seen angels and the throne. And he has had a vision from heaven about the end times. Uh, but when we get to this portion of the book, uh, John is going to do something that we've seen him do before. Uh, we have seen that as John ended the sixth seal judgment, that we had a sort of parentheses there where he took a break kind of from the flow of the story and spent a little extra time talking about something a little bit extra that was maybe uh, something important that you needed, certainly, but kind of stopped the flow a little bit. And he does it once again. We have just ended at the end of chapter 9, the sixth trumpet uh, judgment. And now the Apostle John is once again going to take a little break from the judgments and he's going to talk about something else. In fact, what he, what he did last time and what he does again is talk about two different things. And as it begins the story, it's like he blinks and all of a sudden he's back on earth. And we get the perspective of John viewing things from the earth again. And we, we've seen as, as we've gone through this, John has a vision in heaven and then he looks down to earth and looks back up. But now it's as if he's back there on the Isle of Patmos and he sees an angel come. And let's read the story about what happened and what God says to us through these things. The Bible says in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 10, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head. And his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book, which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea, and his left on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seventh peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me, saying, Go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. When I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. What in the world did we just read? Well, it took me a long time to get through it, but I think I've got it for you. But if I'm wrong, I apologize. Uh, but here's what I think is going on. As, as the parentheses begins and the break begins, it starts in verse 1, and it's going to end in chapter 11, verse 14, I believe it is. And, and we're going to see three different people that will be introduced to one is an angel i say people a person and in chapter 11 two witnesses so we're just going to talk about the first one for right now 
And just to begin with, I'll say, God in this is sending a messenger. He's sending a messenger with a message. This is the angel that comes down. Verse 1 says about this messenger, he is a strong angel. Uh, that's a little unusual. You don't see that word strong every time the Bible speaks of an angel. In fact, in the book of Revelation, you only see it three times. But there was something different about this angel, bigger and more powerful than other angels. Now, it could be that he is referring to strong in the same way that Jude refers to Michael, an angel, when he calls him an archangel. But that word archangel is only one time in the Bible, and maybe he means that, maybe he does. I, I kind of think he doesn't, but maybe he does. But this is a different angel. You saw a strong angel in chapter 5, and you see one again in chapter 18. So here is another strong angel. And the Bible says he is another, and that word another means another of the same kind. So this is an angel like other angels, just bigger and more powerful. And we see him coming down from heaven, out of heaven. And so John is seeing him from the earth. So John is once again back with us down here on the Isle of Patmos. And as he sees this angel coming down out of heaven, he is clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was on his head. His face is like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. And so this angel, in a sense, has a uniform. And the uniform may be part of the message. For instance, when we see uh, the cloud, we're reminded of the judgment of God against the earth in the days of Noah when he sent the rain upon the earth. But when we see the rainbow, we're also reminded of the mercy of God. And so uh, there, there's both of these involved. Uh, he resembles God in his appearance. Many times we have seen God described in various ways and even seen Jesus described in the same sorts of ways as this angel. So as he brings this word, brings this message, brings this book with a message, we know that he is coming from God and he as the messenger of God is appearing like God in many ways. Uh, you can read in Ezekiel chapter 1 or chapter uh, three of Ezekiel and see God described very often in ways like this angel is being described. And I've thought about that a lot because sometimes people see this angel the way he is and even see later on when he speaks like a lion and other things that he does and they, they confuse him for God. And I'm, I'll admit that in the past I might have done it myself and thought, well, maybe this is one of the persons of God coming. But he is an angel. He is another angel, one of the same kind. But... Um, I think that when the Bible calls angels children of God, I'm often mindful that children look like their parents and a child of God can resemble God, and I don't have a problem with that at all. So these are angels. This is an angel. It's a strong angel, and he's coming down. And the Bible says that he has an open book. You see that in verse 2? He had in his hand a little book which was open. Now, the idea about an open book is this. You're able to read it. Do you remember in chapter 5 and chapter 6 of, well, yeah, it was chapter, no, chapter 4 and chapter 5, uh, the big deal was that God had in his hand a scroll. That's what this book is. It's a scroll, and it was sealed up. And Jesus took the scroll, and he began to break the seals on the scroll. So as you unroll the scroll, you would break a seal as you got to each particular part. It would have a wax kind of seal on it, something that would hold it together and keep you from opening it. But as he would open the scroll, you'd be able to read the whole thing. And so it may very well be that he has in his hand now the very scroll that Jesus received from which he has now opened all of the seals and it's on the front and the back able to be read. It may be that that's what he's carrying. We don't know. I'll just remind you that sometimes people are very dogmatic about what things are. Uh, in the Bible or in the book of Revelation especially, they'll say, this has got to be this. Well, if the Bible says that's what it is, then yes, it is. But if the Bible doesn't explain it, sometimes you just got to say, it could be this, it might be this, but we don't know for certain. And I think it's a whole lot better to be a little bit more careful about these things than to be dogmatic about something and find out later on that you're wrong. 
Uh, but this one comes and he puts his feet, one on the land and one on the sea. And I think as God's agent or God's messenger, that part of what he is doing is he is reminding us that God has laid claim as, of sovereign ownership over all of this earth, over all of creation, that everything belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he has been given dominion and everything has been put under his feet. So here comes the messenger and the book contains a message. The book is open. It's able to be read. Verse 3 and 4, we see that God begins to speak. He cried out with a loud voice. That is, the angel does. And when, as when a lion roars. And when he cries out, seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. Now, you probably remember this if you've been with me since chapter 1 in Revelation, that there was a time when we saw the Bible talk about the seven spirits of God. You remember that? And we talked about why that was the Holy Spirit. And we turned to Isaiah chapter 11, and we saw the Holy Spirit of God described in seven different ways. And I said, well, you know, that's kind of like saying about Greg that there's seven Gregs. Well, he's a father, he's a husband, he's a pastor. And you could name a whole bunch of things about me and say, well, that's the seven Gregs, and you're just talking about one person in seven different ways. Well, again, you see seven thunders here, and I think that this is connected to another passage of Scripture. Now, I'm going to turn there, and if you'd like to, you can too. I'll give you a second in case you do. It's Psalm 29. This is one of the reasons why it's very good to have a pen in your hand when you're with me, especially in this, so that you can write down these things and come back to them and remember them again. Psalm chapter 29. I'm hearing the angel wings flapping, and so I'm just waiting a minute while you get there. Remember, that's what Adrian Rogers said. It sounded like when pages of the Bible were turning. It sounded like angel wings that were flapping. Psalm chapter 29. All right, look at verse 3. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. Now, I'll tell you what I did in my Bible. I underlined the word thunder there, and the word voice I circled. Now, I'm going to keep reading, and every time you see the word voice, you might want to circle it. Let me go back to verse 3 and read it again. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice, there it is, of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Look down at verse 7. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve. Now, if I stop right there and I begin to count, I see that there's seven times that I circled the voice of the Lord. And in that passage, it says, The voice of the Lord, the God of glory, thunders. And very often in the Bible, you will hear the voice of God described as thunder. And there you see seven voices of God uh, or seven thunders, as it were. I think there's a connection here to what we're reading when we read that there were seven peals of thunder uttering their voices. So I'm back in Revelation chapter 3, I mean chapter 10 again at verse 3. So I'm just trying to say to you, when I read that verse, what I think is happening here is God is speaking. I think John is hearing words, and he calls them the seven thunders, seven peals of thunder, just like earlier he talked about the seven spirits. I believe there's a, a relationship there, a connection between those things. And so the seven peals of thunder, they uttered their voices. And so God speaks, but in verse 4 it says, when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. Now, obviously, when John hears, he hears something that is audible and understandable, and he can actually write down what he has heard. He didn't hear just a sound, a loud boom. He heard words. So he's going to write this down. So I was about to write, John says, but I heard a voice from heaven. 
And the voice from heaven said, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder had spoken. Do not write them. Now when God speaks, understand that there are some things that will never be revealed. Uh, this is something that God has chosen to give to John, but he's not chosen to give it to you and he's not chosen to give it to me. And that's fair. God can do what he wants to. God doesn't have to tell us everything, but God will tell us what he wants to tell us. And when God chooses to seal something up and say, that's not for you, there's nothing you can do to figure it out. You can guess, you can think, you can try to, solve the mystery, but if God wants it to be hidden, God's going to hide it, and you're not going to be able to find it. And so when we think about these end times and what's happening and what John is seeing and experiencing, uh, there are a lot of things that are going to be going on that we don't know what's going to be going on. It, there, God hasn't told us everything. He has just told us some things. Now, you can probably in your, in your imagination understand that when John is writing this, that his mind might be going back to a time with Jesus. And let me just share with you what the story is like. This is from John chapter 12. Uh, here's what happened in John chapter 12. I'm going to begin in verse 27. Uh, I'm just going to read you about four or five verses. You can turn if you want to, but let me read it to you. Uh, Jesus cried out and said, Now my soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The, pe the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it thundered. Others spoke, or others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's going to give his life. He's going to die for the sin of the world. He's going to defeat the devil. He's going to stomp his head into the ground. He's going to knock his teeth down his throat. The devil is a defeated foe. Jesus is about to beat him. Uh, and, and he's right there at it in chapter 12. He's, he's very close to the cross. And his soul is troubled. But his desire is for the glory of God. And he prayed to the Father, glorify your name. And God spoke, the Father spoke back to his Son. And says, I both glorified it and will glorify it again. Wouldn't that have been an amazing thing? To hear the voice of the Father cry out from heaven. Some were there, and they heard it, and they understood it. But there were also people that were in the crowd who had hardened their heart and chosen not to believe. And as a judgment against their disobedience, when God spoke, instead of hearing it, to them it sounded just like noise. All they said is what? Well, it just, it's probably just thunder. You know, when you choose to harden your heart against God, when you choose to reject Jesus and not have faith in Jesus, when you choose not to believe in him the way that he's presented himself as the Son of God who is the Savior of the world, the one who died and rose again, the King of kings who is to be surrendered to as Lord of your life, there may come a time when God would speak into your life and you, instead of hearing it, will say, it just sounds like noise to me. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand it as any kind of communication from God. And wouldn't that be all? But you know that there are people all around this world that are just like that tonight. They've sat under preachers. They've had people in their family witness to them. People have talked to them till they're blue in the face about Jesus and their need to repent, their need to trust in Him. And instead of listening, they've hardened their heart. And now instead of hearing God speak into their life, it's just noise. And I wonder maybe if as God began to cry out from heaven, the seven thunders began to thunder. I wonder if possibly the reason that this was shut up, again, this is just a guess, 
may be connected to what we finished with at the end of chapter 9. Do you remember how that chapter finished? Uh, it, with all of the amazing things that we had seen that had happened leading up to the end of that chapter. We, we saw demons flying out from the, from the ground, uh, coming out of hell itself to, to mess with the people of the world. We saw armies by the millions parading uh, toward Israel. Uh, we saw devastations and, and, and things flying out of heaven and fire falling and all this other stuff. But I told you the most amazing thing of all was what we saw at the end of that chapter. Do you remember what it was? It was that they knew. And yet they chose not to repent. Uh, let, let me read it to you again. Verse 20 and 21 of chapter 9. The rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons, the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries. Remember that word sorcery is connected to drug use. Nor of their immorality. That's the word porneia that you get the word pornography from. And it means any kind of sexual deviancy or perversion. Nor of their thefts. With all the bad and all the death and all the destruction, people said, I'd rather have my sin than have Jesus. And they said, I won't repent. And that's amazing. Because by the time you get to that point, you're, you're just hop, skipping, and jump away from the cloud spitting and Christ coming. I mean, you're close right there. And so I wonder if God speaks out of heaven. And you just wonder what he said. Was it, what was it? Well, what if it was an invitation? What if it was the gospel? What if God said no? They made a choice not to repent. They've hardened their hearts. Seal it up. I've given the last invitation I'll ever give. Mm. You know, people sit in church services all the time. They say, you know, I'll come back next week. Maybe I'll get saved next week. Not today, not today, not today. I wonder how many people think and have ever thought in their mind, is this the last invitation I'll ever hear? Is this the last chance I'll ever have to be saved? Friends, when God speaks and you hear, you better act on it. Don't harden your heart. Because one day, you might not hear him speak anymore. You might not hear from God. And you may miss the one opportunity you have to do something. So again, I don't know what he said. I don't know what's going on here. But I do know this. He was speaking, but then he chose to shut it up. Not reveal it. Keep it. Verse 5. What God has sealed temporarily will ultimately be revealed. I'll show you why I'm saying that in just a minute, but let me read the text to you again. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, he lifted up his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and earth and all things in it, the earth and all things in it, and the sea and all things in it. Remember where he's standing? He's got one foot on the sea. He's got one foot on the earth. And now he's raising one hand to heaven. And he, and he swears by the one who made all of heaven and all of earth and all the sea and everything in it. And he says what? There will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Now, I told you that this section, I, I've, I've called it, I've, I've said it this way, what God has sealed temporarily he will, ultimately reveal, he will ultimately reveal. Now, I'll tell you why I say that. I think that this chapter, chapter 10 in Revelation, is very much connected to Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 10 through chapter 12. I told the first service this, I didn't tell the other two this. I said, if y'all go home and read Daniel, chapter 10 and chapter 12. So if you're in the second and third service, you're just going to have to Catch up with the rest of us. But I'm going to turn back to Daniel chapter 10. I'd invite you to turn back with me and follow along. I'm going to spend a little bit of time there, and I'm going to try to tell you why it is that I think that this is connected and related. And since y'all gave me all sorts of time, <clears throat> there's no telling how far I'll go in this thing. 
Now you say, why are you skipping chapter 11, preacher? Well, when you start to get into chapter 11, there's probably over 100 prophecies that God gives in that one chapter. And ain't nobody got time for that. And I don't know how much time you gave me, but I don't have that much time. So uh, we'll just deal with what we got. Daniel chapter 10. I'm going to start reading and we'll start getting into it about verse 5 and 6. But here's what it says. You can catch up with us. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the message was true and one of great conflict, but he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food or did meat or wine enter my mouth, so he's fasting nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed, 21 days. Then on the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the, the, the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and I looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Euphaz. His body was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. Now, you remember the angel that we saw? His face was like the sun. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet were like gleam, like the gleam of polished bronze. The other angel, what did it say about his feet? They were like pillars of fire. So this is an angel that has come to Daniel. Many people believe it's um, Gabriel. But it doesn't call him by name, so it may be, it may not. Uh, but he had these, the gleam of polished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Very much like the other angel. And so, so there, there's a continuity here with, with the one that's coming to see Daniel and the one that comes later. He said, well, they're not the same. Well, this is like 2,600 years before. You'll change a little bit in that amount of time. The angel can change too. That's all right. Doesn't have to look the same. Uh, so there's an angel that comes to visit with Daniel. Now, when Daniel sees his angel... I mean, he just passes flat out. I mean, he, he, his face hits the ground. Angel has to get him up. And even after Angel gets him up, he's speechless. He can't even talk. The angel has to touch his lips. I mean, he, he's messed up. A, a being from heaven has come to him and, and appeared before him and, and spoken to him. And, and it's just overwhelming. And when the angel starts telling him the stuff that he's telling him, you can read about it later. The angel says, you know, when you started fasting and, and praying, you know, I was on the way to see you. And he says, I got opposed by the enemy. There, there, were, there was a, a spiritual warfare and a conflict that kept the angel coming from God in heaven to earth to see Daniel. There, there was a long time where he couldn't break through. And so he describes that war and that conflict in this text. You can read about it a little bit later. And so the, he, he's, he's got these questions about these vision that he's had. And so the angel finally shows up and begins to reveal the answers and, and and give uh, understanding and context to the vision that Daniel had. Now, I'm going to flip over. I'll tell you what, I'll get into Daniel chapter 11 a little bit. Um, now, <clears throat> I'm going to start at verse 36, but before I do that, look at verse 40 real quick. Uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, just the first four words, that, words there. It says what? At the end time. Now, I'm giving you that to put it in context here this part of this book is talking about the end time uh, look back up at verse 36 Daniel chapter 11 verse 36 then the king I'm going to tell you who this king is in the book of revelation he's called the beast it, this is this is the evil one that rises up at the end time the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God and speak monstrous things against the God of gods. That's Yahweh, the one true God. He will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. So his family has some kind of religious background. It may be they have a Christian background. Don't know. But whatever the religion that he comes from, he forsakes it and he abandons it. 
Could be Muslim, could be something else. We don't know. But he has no regard for the God of his fathers. Or, it says, for the desire of women. So there's one or two things that could be true about this guy. He's celibate or he's a homosexual. Right? But he has no desire whatsoever for women. He said, well, that's crazy. Nobody would let that guy get in charge. <laughs> Why are y'all laughing? Anybody been watching the debates? Mm-hmm. Did you ever think there'd be such a day? Mm-hmm. He'd have no desire for the women, nor will he show regard for any other God, for he will magnify himself above them all. So he forsakes whatever religion his family comes from, but it's not like he's turning to another one. No, he thinks he is God, or at least he proclaims himself to be God, and he wants to be worshipped as God. It says in verse 38, instead he will honor a God of fortresses. And what that means is that Really what he's doing is war is his God and he likes attacking and taking fortresses or, or cities or whatever you might want to call it. Warfare is his God. Military might is what's important to him. And, and it's almost as if that is personified as what he worships. A God whom his fathers did not know, he will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones and treasures. He will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign God. By the way, any God that's a foreign God that's not the real God of gods is a demon. And this guy will be demonically empowered in an incredible way. You'll, you'll see it later on. We'll get into it in chapter 12 and beyond of Revelation. He will give great honor to those who acknowledge him and will cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for price. Now, look at chapter 12 in Daniel. Uh, I need to get on with it. At that time, Michael... There's the archangel from Jude chapter 9 and other places in the Bible. The great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. The nation of Israel has been around a long time. What is it saying here? It's be about as bad as it's ever been. It's never been as bad as this. Uh, at that time, your people, everyone who was found written in the book, will be rescued. You might want to write in Zechariah chapter 12 through 14. You can read about it there. Christ returning and rescuing his people. Many of those, verse 12, who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but others to disgraced and everlasting contempt. Daniel speaks of a resurrection. There will be a bodily resurrection both of the saved and the lost. And if you're lost, you will be bodily in hell forever. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. Those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. If you are a believer, you forever will be beautiful. Gloriously so. The Bible says you will be greater than the angels. As for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Now, this is where I've been going and trying to get to. This is kind of the start of it. Daniel's told to do what? Seal up the book until the end of time. Many are going to go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. At the end of time, knowledge will increase. Thank you, Google. But uh, And it's increasing exponentially in a dramatic way, but specifically knowledge that pertains to the end times will increase. So that the closer you get to the end times, the more understandable the prophecies about the end times will become, and it will make a whole lot more sense. Knowledge is going to increase. But until then, seal up the book, he says. I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river, the other on that bank of the river. So when he looks up, he, he's had this one angel who's been talking to him the whole time, and he looks up, and guess what? There's two more angels, one on this side, one on that side. Now, do you know that angels don't know everything? 
And angels learn, and they learn about God by watching us. That God teaches through what happens here on earth. That they learn a lot of things by watching us, but they study us, and they study these sorts of things. So he finds that there's two angels there that have been watching and listening, and, and, and they don't understand, and they're trying to figure things out. So these two others, one on this bank of the river, the other on that bank of the river. That's the Tigris River, where we started. And, and one of them said to the man dressed in linen, that's the first guy that was talking to him, that might be Gabriel, maybe it's not, uh, who was above the waters of the river. So he's floating up there now, just kind of hovering there above the waters. And they ask, how long will it be till the end of these wonders? And when he says how long, he doesn't mean, they don't mean, you know, how long until everything starts, but, but the question how long means once everything starts, how long until it's done? In other words, once the ball gets rolling, how long is it going to take until God finishes these things? So he hears the man in linen. Uh, verse 7, who was above the waters of the river, and he raised his right hand. Does that sound like the one that we just talked about in Revelation? He raised his right hand and his left toward heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever. Sounds just like that, doesn't it? Uh, sounds, but, uh, a, ah, sounds like, what am I saying? And he swore by him who lives forever and ever that it would be for a time and times and half a time. Now, what is a time, times, and half a time? A time is one year, times, that's two years, and a half a time. Three and a half years total. That's the answer to the question. Once all this gets going, what, what are you talking about here? Going all the way back, talking about this beast that's in, in chapter 11, and everything that's going to come about from that. you got three and a half years. As soon as they finish, uh, um, as soon as they finished, Finish shattering the power of the holy people, that's the Jewish people, all these events will be completed. So as for me, I heard, but I couldn't understand. So I said, Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? Go your way, Daniel. These words are concealed and sealed up until what? The end time, just like verse 4. Seal up the book until the end time. Go ahead, Daniel. These words are concealed and sealed up to the end time. Many will be purged, purified, redefined, refined, and the wicked will act wickedly. And none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight and understand. From that time till the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. I don't know if you remember this, but when everything gets started, what starts the last seven years of tribulation is this beast who comes to power makes a peace treaty with Israel. Three and a half years in, he breaks his treaty, invades the nation, comes to the temple, stops their sacrifices, sets up an image of himself, and calls on the Jewish people as well as all the world to worship him as God. Now that's all throughout lots of scripture, but I gave you the cliff note version. Once that happens, you're three and a half years in. You start counting. 1,290 days, it's going to be done. About three and a half years there. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. You say, what does that mean? Well, that means 45 days later, if you're still around, something good's going to happen. But again, it doesn't tell you what, so you don't want to be dogmatic and say it's got to be that. You can guess, and you might be right, but you don't know. As for you, go your way to the end. You'll enter into the rest and rise again to your allotted portion at the end of the age. Daniel, you'll live. Though your flesh be destroyed with your eyes, you'll see God. And you will have a reward. That's what it says. So, back to chapter 10 of Revelation. Think with me for a minute about what we just read and why that connects. Because we live in a day where we are very close, I believe, to the end times. And these things are starting to make a lot of sense. The knowledge that Daniel talked about, well, it seems like things are becoming very clear. And so some might say about the book of Revelation, well, it's not about the end times. Uh, the book of Revelation is about stuff that's already happened thousands of years ago. 
I don't think that's why chapter 10 is here. I think you're trying to connect this. I think God wants you to connect this with what he said in Daniel chapter 10 through 12 in that last prophecy that he gave Daniel where he said this is about the end times. I think God wants you to understand that this is about the last three and a half years before the coming of Christ, that this is the time period that you're in. And, and not to just say, well, this doesn't really mean anything. It's not really effective. You've got the same sort of angel here doing the same sorts of things, making the same sort of oath. God wants you to know that what he says in Revelation, there's a reason that it looks a lot like it's in Daniel because God wants your mind to go to Daniel. He wants your eyes to go to Daniel. And so I think that's why it's there. Remember in chapter 5, I mean chapter 10, verse 5 through 7, I said what God has temporarily sealed will be revealed. I think the ultimate purpose of God putting this here, the, the big picture is this. What God said in Daniel, Daniel seal it up. When you get to this portion of Revelation, it's not sealed anymore. The book in his hand is open. Everything that's been sealed since the days of Daniel, listen, it's going to come to light. I think that's why this is here. What God sealed, he sealed temporarily. Yeah, it was over 2,000 years ago for us. It's a long time ago. But that's not very long for God. But it was sealed, but it wasn't meant to be sealed permanently. That God eventually is going to re reveal it. And when you get to this point in Revelation, it's going to be crystal clear. Everything that God said is just right before your face, right before your eyes. And those who live in that day will know and understand in a way that nobody that came before ever would. So, uh, let's look at this a little bit more. Uh, just look at these verses again. Look at verse 6. In the end of verse 6, it says what? There will be delay no longer. The, the, the end times have come. The end of the end times has come. And listen, when it comes, it comes fast. I mean, three and a half years, you know, when I was 10 years old, it took a long time, but I'm almost 50 and three and a half years is not as long as it used to be. I mean, it, when God starts doing what he's doing, listen, when the snowball starts going down the hill, it, there's going to be no stopping it. And the, these things are going to come fast. And I really don't know that you'll even, you may even be closer to, the end in three and a half years by the time you get here. But once God sets these things in motion, there's no stopping it. And when the end comes, it comes with answers. In other words, when you see in verse 7, it says the mystery of God is finished. A mystery is something that God has concealed that later on he's revealed. And there's lots of things that God calls mysteries in the Bible. In fact, a marriage between a man and a woman and how it pictures Christ in his church. Is a, is a mystery that God had revealed that's been revealed in these last times. Even Jesus coming and the mystery of how God could take sinners and reconcile them, them to himself. How, how could God maintain his holiness and be just and judge sin and yet make a way for us to go to heaven? Well, it was a mystery. You, you didn't really see it. Yeah, he talked about it in the Old Testament, but you know, if you're reading that in the days of Isaiah, you're throwing up your shoulders and your hands and going, what? But now it makes sense. There are things God conceals for a time that later on he reveals. And by the time you get to the end in, in verse 7, it says the mystery of God's finished. The things he spoke to his servants, the prophets, it's all come out. It's all going to make sense. That's why I told you when we started this book, there's going to come a time when you, get, when you, you know, after reading all this book all these years and scratching your head and saying, what does he mean by that? In the end time, people will be able to say, okay, that's what he meant. I, I see it now. That makes sense. The mystery is finished. So, in the end, evil's going to be defeated. God's going to win. Jesus is going to return. And this is really taking us to the point where we understand how God is going to allow destruction of the Jewish people in a, in a terrible way, but it's going to lead to the return of Jesus and the rescue of his people and the salvation of the Jews that are left and all the Jewish people there will be saved. They will look on him, the Bible says, whom they've pierced. And they'll believe. That which is sealed is going to be revealed. Let me get going. I don't know how much time I have left, but you gave me too much time to preach. And some of y'all are going to sleep. So, Verse 8. 
I don't know if you're sleeping or not. I wouldn't look. It was just a guess. I thought I heard a snore. Um, Verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying this, Go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel. Again, could be the, the very book we started with that Jesus has now opened and broken all the seals of. Don't know. But go take that book or that scroll, really what it is is a scroll, which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. And I went to the angel and I told him to give me the little book. He said, take it, eat it. It'll make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it'll be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. In my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. We've been talking about God and how God speaks and God speaks through revelation. And God gives John a word here. Once again, uh, he gives him this word that's in this scroll. It's written down for him. And you know, the thing about God and his word and God's plan is this. It's like a, a two-edged sword almost. It is sweet for a believer to think about the coming of Christ, a new heaven, a new earth, every tear being wiped away, new bodies, a new creation, being with Jesus forever, reuniting with, oh man, it's sweet. But there's a bitter side to it, isn't there? It's not everybody saved. And it's not easy to preach judgment. It's not easy to preach hell. It's not easy to preach. Listen, we need to talk about it But you shouldn't talk about hell with a smile on your face like you're glad people are going. You know, it's bitter. And and a true prophet of God internalizes what God gives. Take it and eat it. It's going to be sweet, but it's also going to be bitter. And so that's what the Word of God is like very often. Sweet for those who have been saved. Bitter concerning those who are lost. But one more thing about it, then we're done. Verse 11. And he said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Here's the last thing I want you to know about God's word. God's word will tell you when you're done. You're not done until God says you're done. John is maybe pushing 100 years old. He's already had a vision of heaven. He's already written down a bunch. He's halfway through the book. But God looks at him and says, John, we've got more work to do. I'm not done with you yet. And the same God that said it to John says it to all believers. You're done when I say you're done. There's still work to be done. There's still life in you. You've still got energy. There's a way that you can keep contributing. I've got something for you to do. And so I hope that you'll think about that, that if God will take a man like John who walked with Jesus as a young teenager and now at maybe pushing the age of 100, God says, keep on going, son. You're not home yet. Keep at it. Think about how God might use you. God spoke. God sent an angel. God sent a messenger. God sent thunder. God sent a word that was bitter and God sent a word that was sweet. But God in the end said this, everything I've said, I'm faithful to do it. And you may not understand it all now, but the closer you get, the more clearly you'll be able to see. And in the end, it's all going to make sense. I don't understand it all. It doesn't all make sense to me, but I know this, God's faithful and I can trust him. I may not understand it all and get it all right now, but one day it's all going to come out the way it's supposed to. I just know this. I want the word of God to be sweet for me and not bitter. I want the good stuff, not the bad. And so I need to be on the right side of God. I need to have my faith in Jesus. I need to have my my eternal destiny settled. I need to know that home is heaven and my family is the family of God. The day I put my faith in Jesus, I settled all of that. If you've never done that, I want to invite you to do it tonight. If you need to make any other decision tonight, This altar is going to be open. Let's bow our heads and pray together. And if I can help you to know Jesus, I'd love for you to step out and meet me right now.